Good morning, I'm Diane Macedo. Thanks for streaming with us. Let's get right to the latest on the war in Ukraine. Ukraine says its forces have taken back a village near Chernihiv. Russia pledged to reduce its military operations in the area, but has continued airstrikes on the city. The Russian Defense Ministry also announced a ceasefire in Mariupol to allow civilians to be evacuated. This recent verified drone video shows the destruction in the port city, including a destroyed drama theater and other buildings. And intelligence officials now claim that Vladimir Putin has been misinformed by his advisors about how badly things are going for Russia. Foreign correspondent James Longman has the latest from Ukraine. U.S. officials believe Vladimir Putin is being misinformed about Russia's poor military performance in Ukraine by advisors too afraid to tell him the truth. One of the Achilles heels of autocracies is that you don't have people in those systems who speak truth to power or who have the ability to speak truth to power. Declassified intelligence saying that Putin feels misled by his defense ministry, which didn't even tell him that conscripts were among those fighting and dying in Ukraine. We've seen Russian soldiers, short of weapons and morale, refusing to carry out orders, sabotaging their own equipment, and even accidentally shooting down their own aircraft. Their claims about drastically reducing military activity in Ukraine's north also labeled spin by the Pentagon, but images from Kyiv and Chernihiv telling a very different story. Bombardments ongoing in Irpin, a key suburb just miles outside the capital. And in Chernihiv, this video shows the aftermath of a Russian strike on a local market. President Biden speaking with President Zelensky on an hour-long call, saying the U.S. will provide the Ukrainian government with $500 million in direct budgetary aid. I've told President Biden what Ukraine needs. I was as sincere as possible with him. U.S. aid is essential for us. In other regions of Ukraine, the Russian assault relentless. The besieged port city of Mariupol in ruins, bombed out homes and buildings covered the city, a Red Cross warehouse, seen in the satellite photo, struck by bombardments. Hundreds gathering for the funeral of three Ukrainian soldiers. And James Longman joins me live now from Kyiv for more on this. And, and James, earlier this morning, you and I spoke right after an explosion hit close to where you were. Um, so now that we know that you're okay, I want to take a look at that moment and then ask you a little bit more about it. And James, we're still waiting on official confirmation of what exactly that was, but what are you learning about it at this point? Well, Diane, we just went to try and have a look. Uh, we drove down, it's something like eight kilometers away, driving from where we are here. As the crow flies, it's actually a lot closer than that, and that's why we just kind of, we heard such an extraordinary explosion where we're standing here. Um, it's very difficult to see any real impact. And, and the thing that really strikes you when you go down there is people just getting on with their lives. They haven't even closed the roads. Uh, people are just kind of driving down the main highway there. It's just alongside uh, the river. I mean, we saw uh, huge plumes of smoke coming up into the air, but very quickly they dispersed. And, and now people in that part of, uh, of the city are just getting on with their lives. It just shows you that kind of getting on with life is a form of resistance here. Uh, people here in Ukraine just are defiant. Uh, they don't want to let uh, Vladimir Putin uh, continue this assault on their country, even under the very real possibility of death and, and the danger that continues. And it just underlines the, uh, the feeling here in Ukraine that Russia is lying about moving away from the capital. They've told uh, the world that they want to uh, de-escalate, they want to move troops away from Kyiv. That may be happening, but they've continued their bombardment of certain suburbs. That's what we saw earlier this week. And now a, a, a target as yet unidentified, very central here in Kyiv. So for anyone thinking that the whole war is now reorientating towards the east of Ukraine, that just doesn't feel like that way here now, Dan. <laughs> Now, NATO's secretary general says that Russia lied about withdrawing troops and that they're instead trying to regroup, resupply and reinforce its offensive in the Donbass region in eastern Ukraine. What does that mean for peace talks? Well, look, I mean, the Ukrainians are committed to trying to get a deal. They have said this from the very beginning. They very much obviously want, they're desperate for a deal. They want to stop this invasion. Uh, and I think they will be well aware of Russian games away from the negotiating table. This is a, a long tro trodden path that Russia has been on. Talk about wanting peace, sitting down for peace at the negotiation table, but continuing to exert pressure elsewhere. The difference this time is that Russia is up against an adversary here in Ukraine that understands how it plays the game. And so I think the Ukrainians will very much know that 
strikes like this on Kyiv, uh, bombardments uh, on other parts of the country, the continued bombardment of areas to the south in, in Ukraine, including areas where people are being given humanitarian aid. All of that is meant to push Ukraine away from the negotiating table. But so far, they're staying strong. Dan? Now, Ukraine also says that its troops have retaken some territory outside of Kyiv and Chernihiv, where Russian forces have been pulling back. So how significant is that? Well, hugely significant for the people who live there. Um, we spoke to some who had fled Irpin, which is one of the suburbs that we're talking about there here in Kyiv. It's a, it's a town just outside of Kyiv. And we spoke to a couple who had left an 85-year-old man who had had a stroke some 12 years ago being looked after by his wife Svetlana. They were too frail to leave originally and just had to hunker down where they lived. They said that Russian troops had basically occupied their apartment building. They'd settled in, in, in apartments around them. And then as they left, as the Ukrainians moved in, Russian troops left and then launched a pretty uh, kind of awful attack on the city. They continued their kind of indiscriminate bombardment of civilian areas. And so it is significant that the Ukrainians are retaking these areas, but it now gives Russian, uh, the Russian forces the opportunity to continue with their bombardments. And, and that, uh, and for people like Svetlana and her husband Vladimir, you know, they have now left. They're waiting to be able to re return to their town, which has apparently been retaken by the Ukrainians. But what will they find when they do? That's the big question for millions of people now here in Ukraine. I'm there. sure. And, and James, the Russian Defense Ministry also announced a ceasefire in Mariupol to allow civilians from there to be evacuated. How are those humanitarian corridors holding up? Well, on different days, you get different reports. I mean, we know that the World Food Programme, for example, has been able to operate there. They've been able to give out food. There's, some, there's a suggestion that some 45% of Ukrainians are worried about getting food. Uh, but the, the kind of exit of civilians from Mariupol is also a political move on the Russians' part. They want to empty the city of as many civilians as possible um, it, who, who don't want the Russians to occupy that city. So I think you have to see this as, yes, it's an effort to get people to safety but also from the Russian point of view they see Mariupol as Russian so people can leave and they can perhaps maybe in the future they plan on repopulating it with uh, Russian speakers making it a Russian city because whilst we're talking about uh, uh, you know Russia withdrawing from certain parts of Ukraine Mariupol that that city is very much in their sights as a place they want to keep it's part of the greater Donbass region and they see it as uh, Russian they want to keep it also for a strategic uh, reason because it, it forms a land bridge if you like from the Donbass towards the Crimea uh, so Mariupol has been in the crosshairs for very very distinct reasons. Diane. Right. James Longman and Kiev Ukraine for us. Stay safe, James. Thank you. And let's bring in ABC News political director Rick Klein for more on all of this. Rick, the Kremlin is responding to reports that Vladimir Putin is being misinformed by saying that the U.S. just doesn't understand Putin or how decisions are made in Moscow and that that could lead to, quote, erroneous decisions of the United States. What do you make of that response and why is the U.S. declassifying this intelligence about Vladimir Putin's advisors misinforming him now. Diane, I think what we're seeing here is the, the American administration try to play a game, a, a different type of warfare, uh, a 21st century version of it, which includes information warfare, sometimes uh, trying to get in, the, in your opponent's head. We saw this early on with the unprecedented declassification of information that uh, was meant to call out Putin's intentions when he was publicly saying he had no intention of invading. Uh, the U.S. side was putting all this information out in a, in a way that we've never done before. And now it, it, it has the hallmarks of a, of a strategy of trying to, to, to rattle Putin a bit and also people around Putin. Uh, we've seen the president just last week say that Putin can no longer remain in power, but there's been an undercurrent to all of this, uh, almost encouraging that, uh, that Rus Russians to, to take it upon themselves to do something about their form of government. And they're not outright calling for an overthrow, but it's enough to maybe make people in, in Putin's inner circle concerned. And again, just get under the skin of, of a Russian leader who, who, as the Russians point out, we don't really understand all that well. Now, President Biden pledged another $500 million in direct aid to Ukraine. Where will that money go and what effect could it have? 
Yeah, this is interesting, Diane, because this is direct budgetary aid, which is as close to just writing a check uh, as a country can get. It, it's leaving it to the Ukrainians to, to spend at their discretion to try to prop up their economy, uh, provide uh, vital services throughout. This is different than the billion dollars plus that the president just recently announced in humanitarian aid and assistance and also the U.S. plans to admit some 100,000 Ukrainian refugees. This is recognizing that the Ukrainians are in for a long haul. And, and sometimes the best thing you can do is just send cash. Let the, the Ukrainians figure out how to do this and how best to support their own uh, in, you know, internal services uh, at a time of utter crisis and, and so much suffering in their country. And the president's also considering a plan that would ease gas prices here in the U.S. What can we expect from that? Yeah, we just got word, Diane, the White House confirming that uh, the plan is to, to start releasing oil uh, from the Strategic Petroleum Reserve at a million barrels a day uh, for the next six months. Uh, it is a, a larger supply than has ever been released from the United States on that kind of a, a timetable. The idea is twofold. One is to obviously increase supplies uh, and, and ease gas prices. The hope is that it, it starts to push those down a bit. It also, uh, as they're sold, allows the U.S. to then uh, purchase uh, replenishments uh, at, at a later time through the Energy Department. The other prong to what we're hearing from the White House today is um, increasing the, the pressure on companies to produce energy uh, at, at places that they have federal leases. We've heard a lot from the president on this recently. He is asking Congress to start charging companies essentially a tax, a, a fee, on unused leases to try to spur additional development uh, that, according to the White House, will take probably the better part of the year to get underway. So this is the most aggressive actual action we've seen. But of course, it does come with, with the price. This Strategic Petroleum Reserve is it's something of a 20-year supply low right now. It is meant for true emergencies. If there was a real disruption in the supply chain, um, it's not meant to, to, to ease day-to-day -day gas prices, but the president is recognizing this as a national security crisis at the moment. All right, our political director, Rick Klein, thank you. Thanks, Diane. Coming up, Chris Rock has made his first public comments after Will Smith slapped him during the Oscars on Sunday. What he's saying about that moment when we come back. Welcome back to ABC News Live. The Biden administration is expected to end asylum limits at the U.S.-Mexico border by May 23rd. The Trump-era restrictions were put in place to prevent the spread of COVID-19. Now Republican lawmakers are urging the president to do more to curb an influx of migrants. This comes as Ukrainian refugees and Russians fleeing Putin's regime have started appearing at the southern border. The U.S. men's national soccer team is headed for the World Cup. They lost to Costa Rica 2 to nothing, but that was enough to secure their spot in the tournament after failing to qualify four years ago. This will be the team's 11th appearance. The World Cup kicks off in November in Qatar. And the fourth Blue Origin rocket has successfully launched to outer space. Six crew members lifted off from West Texas and Jeff Bezos' new Shepard rocket today. The mission was another 10-minute thrill ride to the edge of space and back. Comedian Pete Davidson was scheduled to be on board, but had to cancel. And we're following a tornado outbreak in the south. More than two dozen tornadoes touched down across seven states overnight, causing widespread damage and destroying homes. Now those storms are moving east. Chief meteorologist Ginger Z is in Jackson, Mississippi with more. Hello? Can anybody hear me? Overnight, the eerie search for survivors in southeast Mississippi ringing like the sirens had blared for so many as millions of people across the deep south are waking up and battling the impacts of severe storms 27 tornadoes reported so far in seven states more than 190,000 without power in mclean mississippi roofs unlatching and trees toppling into homes this one crashing down in the strong winds before the actual storm right outside the governor's mansion in jackson more than 350 people seeking shelter in this safe room, built to withstand 250 mile per hour winds. The same storm passing through northwest Arkansas early Wednesday, with it an EF3 tornado whipping through Springdale with 145 mile per hour winds, leaving seven people injured, several buildings and cars destroyed. In Louisiana, those extreme winds causing a pileup on the highway. 
It was such a vicious line of storms that's still ongoing, but first I'll show you the damage here in Jackson, Mississippi. This tree, uh, one of the casualties, and there are so many pockets of this, and you can see from our drone there that this duplex had a narrow miss. Those cars entangled, certainly going to be uh, tough to get that out, and a lot of places are cleaning up today. There will be more because we've got tornado watches in place as we speak. You can see them from North Florida up through Georgia, and this is just the beginning of a very long day. By tonight, we'll end up seeing the potential for damaging winds in excess of 60 miles per hour through New Jersey. So we're talking Trenton, Short Hills, Lebanon, up to New York City, Philadelphia is included, Raleigh's in there, Charleston. Almost no one gets away without seeing this storm before we say goodbye to it by tomorrow. Diane? All right, Ginger Z in Jackson, Mississippi, thank you. And comedian Chris Rock took the stage last night at his first comedy show since Will Smith slapped him at the Oscars. Rock says he's still processing what happened. This is the Academy now says Smith was asked to leave the ceremony afterward, but refused. TJ Holmes has more. Comedian Chris Rock back on stage in front of a sold out crowd in Boston. In this audio obtained by Variety, Rock, for the first time, publicly addresses that slap by Will Smith at the Oscars. I don't have, like, a bunch of about what happened. I'm still kind of processing what happened. So, at some point, I'll talk about This, as the Academy reveals, Smith was asked to leave the award ceremony after the assault, but refused. Will Smith just smacked the out of it. The Academy has now started disciplinary proceedings, saying in a statement, things unfolded in a way we could not have anticipated. We also recognize we could have handled the situation differently. Vowing to take action against Smith for his behavior, which could include suspension, expulsion, or other sanctions. The Academy also saying to Chris Rock, Mr. Rock, we apologize to you for what you experienced on our stage and thank you for your resilience in that moment. It was sickening. It was absolutely I physically felt ill, and I'm still a little traumatized. Oscar host Wanda Sykes appearing on Ellen called the Academy's decision to allow Smith to stay seated in the front row of the show gross. This is just the wrong message, you know? Like, you assault somebody, you get escorted out the building, and that's it. Smith has apologized for the incident, calling his behavior unacceptable and inexcusable. But Sykes says the three hosts also deserve an apology, but have only received one from Rock. I saw Chris, uh, you know, at, at Guy's party, and as soon as I walked up to him, the first thing he said was, I'm so sorry. And I'm like, why are you apologizing? He's like, it was supposed to be your night. And Diane, uh, Wanda Sykes there, ever the comedian, she said part of her disappointment that Will Smith wasn't kicked out of the theaters because she had a joke ready for when he won for Best Actor. She was going to get up on stage and say, unfortunately, Will Smith could not be here tonight. Um, but back to Chris Rock, um, we had producers in the room for his show, and there were tense moments. There was an altercation that broke out into the audience, an argument, and didn't seem to have anything to do with Will Smith, but it just created a tense moment. But also part of the tension, some people in the audience were uh, screaming anti-Will Smith chants. Um, there were times that security and increased presence in the aisles and also even on stage at Chris Rock at some point. So just some, some tense moments, but uh, we're going to hear more from Chris Rock, uh, no doubt, Diane. All right, a lot of tension all around. T.J. Holmes, thank you for that. Coming up, the mother of the Navy SEAL candidate who died after finishing Hell Week training is speaking out for the first time. That interview when we come back. Welcome back. The mother of a Navy SEAL candidate who died in February after Hell Week training is speaking out for the first time in an exclusive interview. Regina Mullen says something sounded wrong when she called her son before he died. Our Amy Robach sat down with her. And I wake up every night thinking of him, thinking of how he died, probably not breathing. Nearly two months after the unexplained death of Navy SEAL candidate Kyle Mullen, his mother Regina is breaking her silence, saying she wants to prevent another family from experiencing the same tragedy. What made Kyle want to be a Navy SEAL? He wanted to be the best of the best, and he really wanted to do it to help save people. The 24-year-old former football player from New Jersey had just completed Hell Week. <laughs> A grueling five and a half sleepless days of underwater and tactical training designed to push SEAL candidates to their physical and mental limits. Get in the mud! Those who drop out during Hell Week or ring the bell have to wait two years to try again. Kyle made it through. 
He sent me a text, Hell Week Secured. I saw it and I call him and he says, I did it, Mom. And he was so happy and I heard him out of breath and I said, Kyle, are you okay? Are you hurt? Are you in a hospital? And he just responded, don't worry, Mom. I'm good, I love you, and he hung up. And then I texted him immediately, you don't sound good. And I never heard from him again. The last words he said were, I love you, Mom. I love you, Mom. But you knew as a mom and as a nurse that he didn't sound good? It was just his breathing. He could, it was difficult for him to form the words with the airflow. It sounded labored. He couldn't breathe properly. So how did you find out that he had died? Saturday morning, around 8-something, there was a knock on my door, and I saw people in white suits at my door. And I opened the window. I said, is he in the hospital? They said, no, ma'am. They said, can we come in? And I let them in, and I said, he's not coming home, is he? And they said, no, ma'am, he's not coming home. At the time, the Navy released a statement saying Mullen and another sailor had reported symptoms and were taken to the hospital. The other sailor recovered. Mullen's death is now under investigation, and no official cause of death has been released. Regina believes her son was abandoned right when he was most in need. I'm told that the medical team was let go at 12 noon, and someone was on call, and they didn't answer. Have you gotten any real explanation from any official about what happened to Kyle? No, I don't have any autopsy results. They're investigating it. And they tell you, they say, that's all they say. You've gotta be frustrated. Mm -hmm. But as a nurse, what do you believe happened to your son? I believe he, they laid him flat and he had sipe and he most likely couldn't breathe and he probably suffocated from his own bodily fluids. SIPE stands for swimming-induced pulmonary edema, fluid buildup in the lungs without choking on water. The majority of cases clear up within 48 hours, but in rare cases can be deadly. Regina says Kyle had been treated for SIPE during training in January. During Hell Week, NCIS investigators told her Kyle was treated with oxygen twice, including on the day he died. And even during the process, my son was telling me it's discouraged to say I need to go to the medical. He said he, they wouldn't let him go to medical unless you quit and ring the bell. Kyle didn't want to ring the bell. No, no. He would rather die trying. But this case, he didn't die trying. He got through it and he completed it and there was no medical. There was no medical support there for him or he'd be alive today. I do believe that. We've heard it many times, no one left behind. And I think, unfortunately, you know, Kyle was left behind in this situation. Regina says when she flew out to California after her son's death, a commander told her Kyle had twice been offered medical treatment, but he refused. At that point, I said he doesn't know what day of the week it is. He hasn't slept in five days. How can he make that determination? And I said to him, where was your medical team? Where were they? What did he say? I don't really get an answer. The Naval Special Warfare Command told ABC News in a statement that all candidates receive head-to-toe medical evaluations, including a full set of core vitals, a minimum of once a day, and as required throughout the week, as well as upon conclusion of the assessment event. What does the Navy need to do to prevent this from happening again? Have someone standing with just a stethoscope. That's it. He just needs someone to care about his condition when he came off before he went to go lay down and go to sleep. That's it. A medical professional with a stethoscope could have prevented this. What would you say to any of the Navy officials who are watching this right now? They need better training. They need better monitoring. And this could never, ever happen again. No mother should ever have to feel my pain that I have. Our thanks to Amy Robach for that report. I'm Diane Macedo. Our thanks to you for joining us. And stay with us as ABC News Live continues with news, context, and analysis right after this.